Stacey Schiff is the author of Vera, winner of the Pulitzer Prize, St. Exupery, a Pulitzer Prize finalist, and A Great Improvisation, Franklin, France, and the Birth of America, winner of the George Washington Book Prize. She was inducted into the American Academy of Arts and Letters and has been named a Chevalier des Arts et Lettres by the French government. And Heather Cox Richardson is professor of history at Boston College and an expert on American political and economic history. She is the author of six books on American politics, including, most recently, How the South Won the Civil War, Oligarchy, Democracy, and the Continuing Fight for the Soul of America. And she just told us that she has a book coming out in September 2023. Please look for it. It is called Democracy Awakening, Notes on the State of America. Thank you so much and enjoy. Is it on? It I is think on. not. Uh, can you hear us? That means okay. we're on. First of all, thank everyone for coming. It's a real joy to be here. And I am here in New York um, after just hitting send on the page proofs of my new book because of this lady right here. Uh, I'm thrilled by this new book and thrilled to be here. And I have to ask for everybody else here, why Samuel Adams? Um, okay, this is gonna be the longest answer of the night. I'm usually very concise, but here you go. Um, I would say two parallel tracks, really. And this is why I thought I should write the book, not necessarily why anyone would wanna read the book. Um, but in short, it was 2016, um, and I was grappling for some kind of solid ground. And thinking about um, moral compass compasses and staunch moral fiber and the kind of things, um, the kind of words we were tossing around at that time that suddenly felt kind of meaningless. And I had spent the previous um, four or five years in 1692 Salem, which was a particularly dark and dismal place. And one of the big questions that year with the witchcraft delusion, with the witch panic, is not so much what afflicted the little girls who began to writhe and scream, but how well, how did the trials finally come to an end? Who had the, who had the backbone to really say something is amiss here, um, justice is being perverted, has the court really no sense of what it's doing? And that, at the end of that very long and very dismal summer, took the form of a 34-year-old Bostonian named Thomas Brattle, who was the kind of person who felt compelled, who felt ob obligated to sort of confront the authorities and said, I would rather chew off the fingers of my hand than cast aspersions on authority, but when men err, it is important to say so. And I was kind of looking for a Thomas Brattle in my next subject, I think, in short, and that indirectly led me to Samuel Adams. Can you give us a little more on the indirect? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I thought I was writing about a medieval woman, and when I walked into the library where I do my research, her books were to the right, and I kept discovering that at three in the afternoon, I was sitting over on the left on the floor under Samuel Adams's letters. Um, the indirectly was this. Um, he makes an appearance in a book I had written years ago on Benjamin Franklin, and, when I, and I was sort of surprised to find him there. I mean, he sort of had crept in as a sort of member of the supporting cast, and I hadn't really ever thought about him before, and I think I... I think I use the sort of shorthand that people always use with him of, you know, that rabble rouser, you know, that, you know, head of the faction in Boston, Samuel Adams, and thought very little more about him than that little sort of subjective clause that I had, that I had added. And so I went back to read his letters. And it was in reading those letters um, that I began to thrill to this person who was a deeply idealistic and an almost um, insuperable, I mean, an almost incomparable way for those years able to commit what I, would, what I would today call anthems to the page, really able to sort of distill the real heart, the real marrow of republicanism to the page, to mix my metaphors, and able to do that with immense tenacity over really a dazzling 12 years. And that was, and I finally, after I kept saying to my agent, I, I keep reading about Samuel Adams, he said to me, it seems that you might want to write a book about Samuel Adams. And I conceded that maybe he had a point. Um, I don't know if you can do this without making a spoiler, which I suspect nobody oh, wants. He dies in the end. <laughs> Not in the book, actually. Does he die in the book? You know, I think the biographer always kills off the subject because she he, has He wasn't to. looking good by the end. He was but not I didn't looking think good. <laughs> it was a long. It was a long decline. Well, you found the center of his personality and an essence really in a very unusual place he does not 
come across simply as principal. Do you feel like you can talk about that, or is, is yeah? Is, I don't think that's a. Are we talking propaganda? Mm, well, so so here's maybe where you I'm read the book differently. So I read the book. I, I read <laughs> Which the book, book. Did you read? <laughs> I read the book where you wrote about uh, about Crazy Horse in the sense that he Samuel Adams did not see himself as a as in your writing as uh, a leader of men so much as a, a person who creates a body that he then speaks for. And all I kept, I actually texted her and said, um, this book is brilliant. And I thought, should I say this reminds me of Crazy Horse? And then I thought, no, then she's gonna think I've lost it. But Crazy Horse did the same thing, right? He saw himself as a member of a body that was linked to the, to the ground and to the earth, and they couldn't be separated. And to find your biography, your, your, your dude is not an egotist, even though he is known that way that he is instead something much bigger, I thought was, was, was brilliant. Um, first of all, thank you for not adding that to the text because I've bronzed the text and it's better <laughs> this way. Um, so Totally thrilling for me who, as a biographer, by definition likes to be behind the scenes. So to find myself in the company of someone who was happiest moving the scenery, um, changing the viewpoint, and most of all, assembling a team. I mean, it's, he gets no credit for this, although he did among his contemporaries, but he really recruits most of the major players in New England through these years. I mean, in addition to changing hearts and minds, he is a one-man recruiting office. And it's because of Samuel Adams that we have James, not James Otis, but John Hancock and John Adams and John Quincy. He's, if you gave an extremely good address at the Harvard commencement, you could expect Samuel Adams on your doorstep the next morning. And he builds this team very carefully and holds it together, which is not always easy, obviously, because everyone on this team is quite strong-minded. Um, but he's able really to do that while himself remaining quite recessive. And yes, I find that to be utterly thrilling and very unusual, right? And, and it also is part of the reason it speaks to how he's forgotten, in fact, because he doesn't, um, he isn't interested in the limelight. He isn't interested in promoting himself. Unlike his second cousin, John, he doesn't publish his papers, although John will say to him, history will forget you, your papers will themselves abundantly explain the American Revolution, you must collect and publish them, and Samuel Adams never does so, I think out of diffidence. Um, and I found that, yes, highly appealing. Well, highly appealing, and I wanted to ask on that front, um, and I'm gonna go in a, kind of sideways, how do you pick your topics? Isn't it obvious? I mean, so you, you know, see where you're sitting? Cleopatra and then the Salem witch trials. That yeah. made perfect sense, and, right? And, and straight to that medieval woman, Samuel Adams. I think, I, <laughs> can, you, can you figure out what's next? Um, I well, think that'd to, be a good game, I think it? to some extent, um, they, are, they have in common the fact that the world is different after they have left it than it was, or after the years in which I'm writing, um, than it was beforehand. I mean, with Cleopatra, with her death, we have the end of the Hellenistic age, we have the rise of the Roman Empire. It is, it is literally a hinge moment in history. I think it's very hard to say that these 12 years of Samuel Adams's, um, depending on you count, 10 or 12 years, um, are obviously utterly, are game changing completely. And so I think that to a certain extent I have wanted to hone in on those kind of people or those kinds of moments. I think there's a little bit of pinballing as to how I've got from one to the next. Um, I think I obviously I've talked about how Salem led somewhat directly to this book. With, with Cleopatra, well, let me go back one more step. Um, I had spent five years in the French archives researching Benjamin Franklin's years abroad. Um, most of the material for those years is held at the, at the, French, at the French Foreign um, Affairs Office, the Quai d'Orsay, which is um, underheated, underlit, um, very difficult to work in. If, you've ever want, if you ever want to read um, 18th century French on microfilm, I can tell you all about it. Um, it's definitely the address where you can find the worst cup of coffee in Paris. And you have to you know, hand over your passport to get entry when the archivists are not on strike as they were often that year. So after those, you know, after researching that book, I basically swore off of French history or anything that had to be researched in France. But I also realized something else, which is that there is an absolute um, avalanche of material about 
Franklin in France. Um, when he's living there in those years, he's um, surrounded by a by a circle of French spies, all of whom are writing everything he does because these men were paid by the word. And that circle of informers is surrounded by a set of British spies who are also reporting on what he does. So you have a massive amount of documentation. And, and added to that are obviously the official French reports um, at Franklin's letters, John Adams's letters, because he's in France objecting to everything Franklin does and writing about it because he has nothing else to do. And everyone in the 18th century seems to have written a memoir. Oh, and by the way, did I forget to mention there were newspapers and then there were official newspapers and then there were unofficial newspapers. So I was just wallowing in material. And I think after that bath of material, a book about someone for whom there is no recorded record was really appealing. <laughs> Um, but, but Cleopatra, in fact, had been, um, had been an idea I had had earlier, and I just couldn't figure out how to do it. And I do think that on some level, having conjured with this mass of, of Franklin material, and finding that even after having ingested all of it, I still couldn't answer basic questions about Benjamin Franklin, made me think, well, then why not try to write about someone where the record is faulty or punctuated or m measly or however you want to call it, why not try at least to establish certain scenes in someone's life? And the more I researched um, Cleopatra, the more I realized that you could actually write a fairly fluid narrative, a fairly something close to a traditional biography. And the other thing, the other road that had led to that was that I had been writing a lot, I've been writing a lot of op-ed pieces over those years about and they always seem to be about women and power and why that is such a toxic combination. And I just, I still haven't cracked the mystery, but that was partly what led me to the idea of Cleopatra in the first place. Okay, now, now I have to ask, do you think your choice of Samuel Adams and your choices going forward are going to be different than they were um, 10 years ago? As in, does the, the moment we're living through change mm -hmm. the way you look at what you think is important to highlight? You know, I would answer that two ways. I would say that the moment is obviously reflected in one's choice of subject, and, and I think it should be. I think there should probably be some historical resonance. And I'm thinking here about what happened after, after the Salem Witch Trials. Nobody talked about what had happened in 1692 for several generations. I mean, it was just, just Arthur Miller, when he went back to research the Crucible, discovered that nobody in Salem would talk about what had happened in 1692. Um, and it wasn't until really the Holocaust that there was the first narrative history of Salem. Um, and then interestingly, it was in reading that history while he was at the University of Michigan that Arthur Miller decided to write The Crucible. And of course, today we know about the Salem Witch Trials from The Crucible. So there's this, there's this resonance, obviously, that put it back on our radar. And I think, I'm, I think I'm, like everyone else, consciously or unconsciously sensitive to what's in the air. But I also feel like one can overdo that a little bit and veer into the tendentious. And here I'm thinking of um, something which is a little bit um, wide of the mark. John Hancock and Samuel Adams, as you know, have a very um, on-again, off-again relationship. They're um, very close confederates, although they don't speak to each other most of the time because they're angry with each other. Um, and it makes sense because Adams is this extremely um, is this extremely austere, principled man, and John Hancock um, is a man of um, is a somewhat petulant character who likes to preen. He's very given to extravagance. His wardrobe is very important to him. He's immensely wealthy. Um, he loves naming opportunities. He loves to be flattered. Um, at one point, he um, travels about with the Harvard records because he's been named um, treasurer of Harvard, but he never does anything with them, nor does he um, give the papers back to Harvard. And they have to be he has to be chased. They have to be chased down. Um, at one point, he comes back from Congress with his entire retinue and stops in a country inn. And neither he nor the retinue pay any of their bills, but on they continue to Boston. And then Samuel Adams stops at the same inn the next day and hears this account of this extra extravagant retinue, which did not pay their bills. You see where I'm going with this. There were some overtones that I might have at a different time played up a little bit more, I think. But this man who was extremely pompous and given to flattery but had no real ideas of his own did remind me of someone when I was writing the book. <laughs> and, I, and I hoped that, that, didn't, that I didn't overshoot the mark on that one. So I feel like you have to rein yourself in a little bit with those things as well. Do you think what you choose to write about, though, changes? I think that maybe changes with age. Um, but I mean, I think that my first book was a very romantic book in some ways. Um, 
but I'm, but I'm not, I, you know, I'm too close to the material. I think the biographer doesn't know her own, herself as well as she knows her subjects. Why did you write the first book? Um, I had reread Wind Sand, and my first book was about Saint Exupery, the French aviator who had written The Little Prince when he was living in New York. And some of the fact that that book was a New York novel um, really kind of threw me because I hadn't known that. Um, and in fact, much of his work, much of his work post-war, actually even before the war, was written here in the city, where he had an extremely active publisher and a very good translator. Um, and I had reread Wind, Sand, and Stars and realized that it not only still reads beautifully and hadn't aged at all, but is really the best account I think we have of humans in flight. And so I got a little obsessed with him. I was in publishing at the time, and I was looking for someone else to write the book, and then I realized I didn't really want to give the idea away. I wanted to write the book myself. I have to laugh that you got a little obsessed with him as you sat under, this is, this is a historian sitting under the books at Samuel Adams, pulling him down and going, I'm not obsessed, really. I'm going to be obsessed, writing about the not medieval obsessed. <laughs> You know, there, just to go back, there, I knew when I started that book that there was one, there were maybe six biographies at that point of saint exupery and I, and I knew there was one written by his former mistress but under a pseudonym, which was male. And I remember sitting in the New York Public Library with like all the books on the table, trying desperately to figure out which one was the one by the mistress. And finally I realized it was the one book that didn't mention his marriage. Oh, wow. That was the point where the obsession took over. <laughs> so I've been, I've been sort of pushing you here when we talk about how you choose what you do to talk and to transition a bit here to the uses of history in this moment in America, which is so fraught, and when people are trying to rewrite history. And I would love to hear how you think about that. Um, I find it's very, I, it's just, we, we had talked about this a little earlier, I find it as disconcerting as we all do. Um, and I find that the only solution I know is to stick as close as I can to the facts, um, which I'd still like to believe, of which I like, still like to believe only one set exists. Um, that seems to be under fire every single day, um, as we discussed. Um, but I still feel as if there is a deep hunger out there for, at, for actual history, and moreover for mainstream history. And I just keep thinking that the only thing to do is to stay the course. Why do you think it matters? Why does history matter? <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> There's this thing about repeating the mistakes of the past, remember? I mean, it's just, it's just over, it's just astonishing to me that so much could, at this point could be so convoluted when it is, you know, I don't, I mean, this has always been the case. You know, I'm looking at, I'm thinking at this point of the record on, let's say, Cleopatra, because there is a record, obviously, and all of it written by men who are in some way hostile to her, many of them writing to please a Roman emperor, and all of whom had an interest, obviously, in contorting the history. And so, for example, simple things like, the Battle of Actium, um, which is the battle which Mark Antony and Cleopatra will lose to Octavian, later Augustus. It's a minor skirmish, which is turned into a major showdown so that, it, so that the glory of it redounds to Octavian, who moreover, by the way, wasn't fighting Cleopatra. He was really fighting Mark Antony, but it was better not to be fighting another Roman at a time when no one had a taste for Roman civil war. So better to make the woman, the foreign woman, the foreign Egyptian woman, the, the villain of the tale. So the whole, you know, here we have this major battle built out of a minor skirmish with actually the wrong, wrong antagonist built into the story. So from the get-go here, you know, you have history be coming down to us in a somewhat contorted and in, in a deformed state by any number of people who are all writing it all for public for the consumption of one man whose ego needs to basically be built upon this victory. Um, so, you know, why do we need history to undo those kinds of contortions? So I would argue that history is the study of how and why societies change. And this is one of the reasons I thought Samuel Adams in your hands was so interesting because he is in your hands a man, I think, for the present. Is that fair to say? I think very much so. Because um, you said you like people who change society, which is what we do. Um, I think that he felt very modern to me in the sense that he, we're talking about a protest movement here, and I very much felt obviously that that was with us as I was working on the book. Um, but there are other ways in which the moment seems very consonant with our own. Um, there's this explosion in media. Um, we didn't talk about this, but Adams is a man of the press. He writes 
almost as often as you must. Um, so, so I have to. This yeah, yeah. is a little bit of a spoiler, but he he begins his press. Prof you know his profession or his, his career in the press, writing as a shoemaker, farmer, shoemaker. And you have this great snarky line in that. Can you deliver that? No, because I can't remember it. Oh. Is it the, is it that the cobbler is the least the, the bottom of the social rung is the cobbler? Is and it? yet he he quotes Cicero and Cicero yeah. and Sallust and Livy exactly. Yeah, yes, right. he's a somewhat well educated cobbler, as because he was from Boston and that's how Bostonians are. Um, <laughs> yes, he's a cobbler who's quoting from the ancients. Um, I forgot where I was going with this. Oh, um, protest movement moments, for the moment. Moment, the why it felt so consonant. So it felt like a protest, a moment of protest. It felt like of a moment of tremendous upheaval where, the, where there's this explosion of media. And Adams is writing endlessly, not as beautifully always as Heather, and under 30 or 32 or maybe more pseudonyms. And so that felt very, that whole sense of suddenly Boston is a town of five or six newspapers, much to the dismay of the, of the crown officials in Boston who couldn't figure out how you could possibly govern a town with five or six newspapers, and the answer was poorly. Um, and, and, and that also felt very similar, as did this feeling that government um, was unresponsive to the people, that, that rights were being infringed, that a large portion of the population felt that a, um, a narrow elite essentially was in charge and was not listening to them. And so there were so, there were so many parts of it that felt very familiar. And in that way, he felt like a hero of the time, as he did in the sense of being able to open the tent to include people, to even bring women and children into this protest movement by involving them in boycotts and pickets and all kinds of sort of street theater in Boston. Yeah, he, he involved people in a number of ways. You want to speak to the way he brings people into this really crazy protest movement? Um, you were leading somewhere. Where are we going with that one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, just that... Just that um, that he uh, is a man for his time, and that he essentially is sort of this l not very successful person, um, and he manages to pull around behind him uh, this movement that, as you say, changes the world. And, and I don't think anybody sees it coming when he's forty-five years old and and could possibly have the L word. One of the <laughs> that which for some reason endeared him to me tremendously that he has this. 45 years of essentially being a layabout and unable to make a living, and I think probably, in fact, supported by dear John Hancock, um, indeed. But I'm sorry, there was somewhere else you, you were going with that? Well, I just thought he was fascinating in that, like I say, he seemed oh. to define himself by yeah. the people. I mean, there's a reason he disappeared. He wanted yes. to disappear. That was the whole point. But also that, that the very fact that he is so unpromising um, and so recessive, I think, leads him to be underestimated by his foes. And I think that's a tremendous credit to him. And it's, he uses it in so many ways that there is this contempt by the crown officials, by the Thomas Hutchinsons of the world, who look upon him as an, a desperado who had nothing to lose, not as a man of principle. And therefore, and he uses that, on, that they're underestimating him to tremendous effect. And it's also what keeps them from seeing what's about to happen. And that too, I think, felt very familiar to where we are today, when the elite can be completely sideswiped by not realizing a level of discontent by a demographic that they don't understand. And that they don't pay attention to. Correct. Um, so I want to, before we go to, to questions here, I want to uh, shift just a second for writing style. The writing style you chose for this book is very immediate. It feels very uh, very much like you're on the street with, with uh, the revolutionaries. Was that deliberate? Is that your general writing style? Did you sit down and say, this is the only way to talk about this man? Because you are also say his own writings are much more sort of florid and, and flowing. I think this is um, m my mature style. There are fewer semicolons on the page. Um, the, the same audiobook narrator read, and I didn't realize this at the time, the same audiobook narrator narrates this book as narrated my Franklin book. And he said, your style has changed so much, which I had not noticed. So no, I didn't do it intentionally. I mean, it, there is meant to be an immediacy to the book. There is meant to be a sense of, I mean, there's, it's a propulsive story. I mean, it's a really compelling, really elemental story that moves very quickly and surprisingly. I mean, there are some backs and there are fourths and there are dead ends, but 
really over those you know 15 years, there is this change in thinking that no one saw coming. Anyway. Um, said narrator said, you know, your, your style was much more florid for Franklin in France, and it's much more direct and simple for Samuel Adams in Boston. And I just thought that's great, that's great. but I hadn't that's noticed right. it. One last question before we go to audience questions. Who's on the Sam Adams beer label? Because it is not Samuel Adams. <laughs> well, I think it's Paul Revere, and you think it's Thomas Paine. Yes. Right. Why so do you think Thomas it's Paul Revere? Paine, in my mind, looks like Willy Wonka. I mean, Thomas Paine, like he has sharp, Features, do you know what you know? Those drawings in the Roald Dahl. He's got sort of sharp features and little eyes. So I don't think it's Thomas Paine. Sorry. Do you know? Did they? Oh did no, I think they think it's Samuel Adams. Yeah, for but sure. Where did they get that picture? Um, I think I knew that answer once. I've now forgotten it. It was commissioned. Does anybody, does anybody know? It's it. It's a pseudo copley yeah. kind of thing. It's do a you pseudo. Know? It's like a take on the copley of Paul Revere, though. Right. He's okay, I lose. Like Look Revere. at that. We got we got a professional tour guide and the writer of that period <laughs> saying it's Paul Revere. So if anybody's taken my classes all these years, it wasn't Thomas but Paine. are you teaching Sam Adams beer in your classes is what we all want to know. I cannot know. tell you how interested students are in the revolution if you put up the Samuel <laughs> Adams beer and say, I'm going to tell you in 70 minutes why this mattered. They never miss a trick. Um, let's, let's open it up now to, to questions. Does anybody have anything they'd like to ask, Stacy? Hi, I don't know if you'll remember this reference, but at one point when you were talking about um, Cleopatra, which I haven't, I haven't read your books, I'm really excited to do so, you said something to the effect of women and power as a toxic combination. I was wondering what you meant by that. So I can't remember what year it was, because I'm not good on chronology of my own life, but I'm really good on other people's. Um, was Hillary Clinton running for office? I don't know. I did a whole series of columns about why there was such an aversion to Hillary Clinton. <laughs> and I couldn't, I still can't get my mind around it completely. And if you look at the literature on Cleopatra, so much of it is written, so much of what she accomplished is written off as seductive wiles. And it seems to me that the reason for that, and I'm really simplifying greatly here, is that for a man to lose to a woman generally in a, you know, on a tennis game is terrible. But for, for, for a man to lose to a woman because she is seductive or has distracted him or you know, just bewitched him, a much more apt word, that's OK. So basically, her accomplishments were wiped out, but her seductive wiles endured, because that was almost an excuse for how Mark Antony, Octavian, Caesar, all of these men fell under her sway. And so we forget the woman completely, and we wind up with the Halloween costume, right? And so I, I think that's kind of where I was, you know, in short, that's where I was going with that. And, and when you go back to the ancients, Plutarch kind of gives her a fairly objective treatment, but all the while wondering how Mark Antony could be so taken with this woman. But everyone else reduces her to this mix of kind of, you know, the, the, the Orient, the opulent East, the, the, the sexual allure, um, she's, she hails from this land of excess and sex, but they don't pay attention to the fact that she's actually running an empire. Thanks. Um, I was just curious, I mean, if you accelerated forward 100 years, who do you think would be a game changer now that you might be interested in writing about? Don't you think we should have Heather answer that question? <laughs> you first. You know, wow, a game changer for right now. Go Just Heather. so you know, when somebody asks a question like that, my mind has gone in completely blank. I'm like, who exists right now? Like, <laughs> but you write about who exists right now, whereas Every single I, night, but right, like I'm sitting so, here going, Cleopatra, no, she's gone. Samuel Adams, who's our Samuel Which, Adams? But this is kind of the running joke in our household because my dear husband who's here tonight always, always mentions people who are 20th century because it would be nice to write about someone where you could read archives that were typewritten, not handwritten. And I always shoot him down with, oh, that's journalism. So the, you know, the real question here is where's the point where history ends and journalism begins? And you know, that does lead me to think, does it, is there a 20th century? Well, I, I think you have to say Biden's a game changer. Um, just historically, because of what he's done with finances and with foreign affairs, mm -hmm. um, but but I'm I'm thinking in my head, who's our Samuel Adams? Right. And um, 
I don't know. What do you? I, I, I'm. Okay, this is a little wacky. Martin Luther King. Well, yeah, he's he's dead, Stacy. Oh, we have to have someone alive. Yes. Yeah, oh. <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah. Can't do that. Years. <laughs> do live people, because that would involve talking to them, which is beyond my skill set. <laughs> There's got to be someone else, though. Yeah. Eleanor Lippmann, the famous novelist, just came up with the best idea, which is Zelensky. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Thank you. Thank you, Ellie. You, could, you better brush up on your Ukrainian. Yeah. <laughs> is it OK if I ask about a former book, a, a, a earlier book? Um, could you just talk about when you were uh, researching your Nabokov book, Vera Nabokov, you actually visited and spent a lot of time and talked with their son. So could you talk a little bit about that? So this is a slightly unfair question because Eleanor Lippmann is my first reader. She's a famous novelist, as you all know, of the most charming novels you will ever read. But in her spare time, she reads everything I write, including my shopping lists. And she knows where all the bodies are buried. So um, she... <laughs> So indeed, for the Nabokov book, I had um, suggested to the publisher that I write this book based on the correspondence of Vera and Vladimir Nabokov, which would, had then been sold to the New York Public Library. What I didn't know is that the Nabokov's son, an only child, Dmitri, um, had indeed sold the papers to the New York Public Library, but he had not yet delivered them to the New York Public Library, and he had them in his basement in Switzerland. Um, I was then the mother of two small children, and off I went to live in Dimitri's basement in Switzerland, um, which was very cold and very moldy, to be honest. But it meant that ha halfway through the day, most days, Dimitri would holler down to the basement and say, don't you think it's lunchtime? And I was thinking, not really, because I have a lot to read, and this is really expensive. And I, off I would toddle to have lunch with Dimitri Nabokov, who was six, eight, maybe, um, and a quite a large man and really liked lunch. And lunch would always go on for a long time. So lunch, the, the Festival des Pâtes, the, the, the pasta festival in Maltra became like the worst thing that ever happened to me because I would end up taking Dimitri to lunch. I was watching my advance vanish, you know, into the air in Switzerland. And over lunch, I would quiz him, of course, about what I wanted to know about his parents. Um, so in fact, we became quite close, but it was always, I was sort of, you know, very reluctantly plucked out of my basement of, of treasures in order to go um, head off to lunch with Dimitri. And Dimitri also had this um, charmless habit of forgetting time zones. So he would regularly call us at 3 a.m. New York time and say, I just thought of something. <laughs> and of course, you know, the pen was by the bedside during those years because he would do this fairly often, which it was an interesting relationship. And it's one I've not ever written about but wanted to about the biographer's um, the way the, the surviving child or spouse and the biographer develop a very intimate rapport because you are basically recording their life for them. He would call me and ask me, you know, what could you remind me, when is my Aunt Helena's birthday? Um, so you become the kind of family scribe in this very kind of interesting way and know things, of course, about them that they don't know about themselves or about their, of their parents that they don't know about, obviously, which is also a, a somewhat sensitive um, game, and I also just remember that I found a box at one point of Dimitri's report cards, which I did not give to him. <laughs> Don't we have a question for Heather? No, this is no. I do too. I have a question. I it can go to both of you if, if that's okay. Um, we've you've spoken a number of times about um, sort of the relevance of. Well, I guess I wonder um, how the worlds you've written about are actually different from now, and actually the ways in which that difference might be important for us to recognize rather than sort of find similarities and connections. I wonder about the dissimilarities, because I think there is sometimes um, we're in planning our, in planning, we contempor, you know, alive now and plan ourselves expecting that we can sort of get it and they're just like us and, and the kinds of problems that's actually generating. I don't know if either of you have. That's a great question. And I, I think between the witch trials and Samuel Adams, I keep trying to push us back to Samuel Adams. It's a good book. You should read it. <laughs> I didn't write those two books. Oh, you wrote those you two gonna, books. I thought you had something to say on the subject. Um, so incredibly important. And also, 
the re is the reason we write history to my mind, right, to some extent, is that we, you know, it is useful to remember that it was not always thus. And, you know, this, yes, there are, you know, one of the interesting things about writing about Cleopatra is how much agency women in the ancient world actually had. And this is this strange, very short-lived moment where women are actually independent units, where they have incomes of their own and businesses of their own and rights, which we are, which, which will go missing for literally another 2,000 years. But that said, there everything else is different. And I mean everything, like the geography of Egypt is no longer the same. Um, and bearing that in mind can be a problem in a funny way because you've got so much to communicate about the difference in temperament and the difference in culture. And I think probably the Salem book is the book where I had the most, where I spent the most time on that because you are talking about people who are li living in a theocracy and you have to understand, and, and the biggest hurdle I think with understanding that book is that witchcraft for them is not a superstition, it is not a Halloween rite, it is fundamentally part of their, tied up in their, in their, in their religion. And that the whole concept of a witch is an extension of evil, is an extension of the devil. It's not a, a superstitious construct, it is a real th thing. And that by identifying witchcraft, by pointing fingers, they felt they were actually exercising their, their pious obligation in many ways. You were doing a service to your community by eradicating some, by eradicating witchcraft. And that was a really difficult, I thought that was a difficult thing that to have to hit with the reader with early on in the book. And you'll see if you look at that book that I talk about the outbreak of witchcraft and then I back up for what I thought, what I hoped was a very fleet 15 pages, which is essentially a short history of witchcraft. Because you had to understand that this was a universal construct at the time. By 1692, in fact, it has released its hold on Europe and on the British Isles, but it still exists in Massachusetts, which is cut off from the rest of the world because the clergy has wanted it to be cut off from the rest of the world. And so, for example, all of the skeptical literature about witchcraft has not penetrated the Massachusetts Bay Colony. So you have to sit with the beliefs of these people and impress those beliefs on the reader without making them seem like they are benighted creatures. Because in fact, there is certainly something to which we subscribe today, which is just as lunatic as the idea of witchcraft was to them. We just don't know yet what it is. But I would love to hear your nominations. So. Well, and my answer to that would be that for all the differences in different societies, that human beings are, are virtually the same. So you say witchcraft, I say lynching. You know, how do people maintain a power structure that they like? And who gets to determine what that power structure is and what are the tools they deploy to make that power structure continue to exist? So the differences are, ve are very important. There is no such thing as history repeating itself. It rhymes, you know, you all don't know that saying. But human beings are still human beings and they still operate on what I would argue is a power, is a, is a power spectrum as they try and accumulate power and uh, under certain circumstances, and they deploy race and sex and um, geology and everything possible to make that happen. So different, but the same. It and also, that dance it is a hard one. It also determines who writes the history, I would say. There's a, wonderful there's a wonderful Aesop's fable in which the lion and the man are looking at a sculpture of Hercules battling a lion, and Hercules obviously is winning. And the man says to the lion, you see men are stronger than lions. And the lion basically says to the man, that's because that was sculpted by a man. You should see what the lions are sculpting. We have a question over here. Yeah, um, the question for Heather, you, in your columns, you do an incredible job, I think, in using history to illuminate the present and vice versa. You have a sort of continuing dialogue between past and present, which wasn't, what you said was that you thought the reason for history was. So I was just wondering about that. So the um, remember, I'm a historian. I'm not a journalist. I know. And I began writing those letters to explain to people how the government works, basically to be a teacher. And what they have evolved to become is twofold. One is a record for 150 years from now. So that, and literally there are nights when it's three o'clock in the morning and I'm ready to kill us all. And, and one of my advisors is saying, go to bed, it doesn't matter, post a picture. And I say, too much happened today. That graduate student in 150 years is gonna wanna see what Richardson said about Trump on CNN last night. I can't go to bed because I've been that graduate student going, what? 
what? Today's the day you decided not to leave your thoughts? So, so partly it is a love letter to that graduate student in 150 years, but partly it is to try and anchor people in democracy and to explain that that world and people make the mistake of thinking I'm a journalist. I, I'm not. That's a very different thing. I'm I'm trying to show people the world that lives in my head, which is really a pian of love to to democracy, and that to for me to jump from from the witchcraft to lynching. That that that's the world I live in. So when I teach history, I'm trying to teach what historians do which is the skill set you need to understand how to evaluate how societies change. And that requires a very close empirical study that often tells us things we don't like. When I went to write my Republican book, I had an entire chapter on how incredibly important Watergate was. And then when I did the whole book, I'm like, actually, it wasn't that important in the scheme of things. Um, in the in the longer sweep, of course, it was enormously important. It wasn't as important as I thought it was. Often you trip over things that you didn't expect to but you need to keep a really clear record because otherwise you get a warped picture of how societies change. So I, I hope that makes sense. Oh, yeah, it does. Um, the way you use past history to eliminate what's going on today. Well, and you have this sort of continually, continual dialogue, I think. Well, in part because of what I was just saying about the way human beings work. And, and there's actually a, a, a pretty complicated theory behind it that, um, that someday I will put on paper. But, but again, she says witch trials, I see power. Where's another place you can look for that? Lynching. Where's an, and I could sit here and do that right now because that's the world that's in my head. It's not like I sit there and say, oh, witchcraft. I better think about something like witchcraft. I say, oh, of course, they're deploying the, the old European tropes of of sexism, they're employing poverty, you know, the, the fact that many of those people who were accused of witchcraft were marginalized already. There, uh, you, there's a big fight over who gets control of the pastorship and who, you know, who has to deliver wood to the pastor, you know, pastor and all that. But I look at that and I say, those are the same tools that one employed over here. And another, and another thing you can see it being employed over here. So that's, I, I, it's not, it's not conscious. It's just, People need to understand these things. And it is tremendously illuminating. And thank you for it. It's fun to do. I mean, it's fun to, to, to help being writing the future. Can I was curious to sort of combine a little bit about a lot of the other questions that have gone on, um, mainly about like the differences between history and now and what makes the modern Samuel Adams, because he's more of a man of letters than anything. And in today's world, the letters are social media, Substack, as you know. Um, how do you think that changes the way we're gonna view history in today, and who gets to be the Samuel Adams for better and for worse in such an open and um, uncontrolled space? L like let, me th let me throw this one to you, because that's a really interesting question. What would today's Samuel Adams look like? And if I can add on to that, if if our boy Sam were alive today, what would he be using for media? And how good would he have been at Twitter? I think he would be um, every evening around one in the morning writing a sub stack <laughs> on democracy. Seriously. Um, if he were lucky, he'd be being read by as many people as Heather is being read by. Um, he'd be all over Twitter. I mean, I honestly, social media is exactly what he was doing before the, before his, in his day. Um, and the extraordinary thing there is just how literate a popular, I mean, New England is famously literate in these years. It's much easier to make these ideas spread. It's much easier to plant these, you know, seeds in the soil that is, in which people are really just reading ravenously. I mean, a single newspaper was handed from hand to hand. It was an invaluable thing. It was, you know, affordable, but it got handed around a great deal. Um, and it, so in that sense, anything that, that infection that we, you know, that contagion of social media would have been just brilliant for his uses instead of having to churn out these things for, you know, a newspaper every three seconds. The, the legion of pseudonyms that he's using corresponds, I think, quite closely to how we look at social media and to, you know, all kinds of catfishing or whatever else you want to call it on social media. I mean, the fact that he is writing as so many- He's a troll. He's a troll. 
Yeah, but in the eyes of the crown, he is for sure a troll, yeah. Um, but the fact that he's using all of these hilarious pseudonyms, um, m many of which, you know, we've lost the joke. It's like Shakespeare. We don't really understand the joke completely. Why is he writing as Alfred? I cannot explain that. Why he's writing as Vindex or Candidus or you're using the name of a Roman general, I get that. Um, or a chatterer makes sense. But adapting those names to the messages, as he often was doing, would have worked brilliantly in a world of social media, certainly. I'm, I'm going to walk away with Samuel Adams as a troll. <laughs> well, it was your line. You shouldn't have said it. <laughs> well, it works. I mean, the horrible thing is it works. And I'm thinking like, well, you know, and, 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 and well, just, well, what, what, about, what, what about the people countering him? I mean, he didn't have the same kind of backlash that, I mean, he, he would not be winning he, against the... He the, does. The, I mean, think about, think about something like after the Boston Massacre. Boston Massacre trial takes place. The soldiers are exonerated. That doesn't stop Samuel Adams, even though John, of course, has defended the soldier. Samuel Adams then spends six months relitigating the trials in the paper. And as he's doing so, using hilarious sometimes, I mean, often crazy lines of logic, like the commanding officer had said he commanded his, his men not to fire, to which Samuel Adams replies, I don't believe the words don't fire are a command in the British Army. You know, I mean, <laughs> sure, I get your point. But anyway, he, he, is, he is opposed by the attorney general, who also under a pseudonym is countering him at every turn. So he's, the troll is being trolled you know, in his own right at that point. But, but nobody, he, he's running circles around people because he's able to write so often. Um, and so ably in so many different guises. And for that reason, you know, it's very hard to kind of contain him. So he's a writer. He really is a writer. I mean, yeah, largely, the, I mean, the body of um, newspaper contributions, which I don't think we've completely been able to entirely identify, um, is really one of the greatest contributions. And what, I, and what I was gonna say to that point as well is that he's, we know his history largely from his enemies because he is so diffident and so little given to the spotlight that he doesn't claim, for, for many reasons, responsibility for a lot of this. So as with Cleopatra, obviously, I was reading from what his detractors had to say about him. And when you're reading someone's life in the account of the people hostile to him, you're often reading exaggerated accounts. You're not, often re you're not always reading the truth. Samuel Adams got credit from a lot of people, for a lot of pieces that he, in fact, didn't write, so. Uh, hi, I'll, I'll take a shot. Um, first of all, I admire you both and I've enjoyed you both so much and it's a pleasure to hear you both in person. Um, oh, okay. So I, I think I, I wanna try and get to what I con would consider like the elephant in the room, like the time these days, the days, th this political moment. And I'm, uh, you, you uh, had talked about how you have to have faith in facts, right? And I'm, I'm wondering whether in the course of your professional lives, uh, you have uh, found yourselves uh, either with strange bedfellows, because Stacy, you write about, you know, our great, amongst other things, our great patriots. So presumably your readers may come from all across the political spectrum, you know, even today. And I, you know, to, oversimpl to oversimplify both, both sides of our political divide are claiming you know, our forefathers as their leaders, or right? Uh, so I'm wondering whether um, either you've had these interesting moments where your facts have turned minds or, that you can think of and want to share, or whether, uh, you know, your facts don't matter because people don't care about the facts or whatever. So I'm just going to put that out to both of you. I hope that wasn't too oh, unwieldy. I, th I think I know where you're going. Let me tell me if this answers your question, and then I want to hear Heather's answer. Um, two things. One, it was revealed to me fairly recently that Cleopatra was being taught at a university I won't name as a feminist tract in disguise, which was news to its author. Um, and then I was told um, recently by a Republican think tank that Vera was a very right-wing book. 
And I hadn't, it took me a while to figure out what that was about. And then I unpacked it and I realized, so what I'm getting at is you often, you're, you're often being read in a way which you hadn't intended or which you at least hadn't realized. Vera spends her life um, subservient obviously to her husband, waiting upon his, him hand and foot because from the get-go she's convinced that he's the greatest literary genius of the 20th century, which some of us would agree with her about. But she therefore spends her life in his service to a point which I think irritated many feminist friends of mine. And also the Nabokovs, because of their forced migration, um, you know, thanks to Hitler, that have they escaped the Russian Revolution, they escape Nazi Germany, they escape France just before the fall of France, they come to America, they are deeply conservative by the time they get here to the point that they support Joseph McCarthy. So I hadn't ever put this all together in my mind as they would be heroes to the Republican, to, they would be heroes to the right. But in fact, that was how the book was read. And that was, you know, totally a revelation to me. I don't have a lot different to say to that, except that one of the things that I like so much about Stacy's work is that, and I hope I do the same, is that you follow the truth as you discover it. You know, the empirical truth, which often takes you to places you didn't intend for it to be. But, you know, I always tell my students that the reason you do that and the reason you record what your facts have uncovered is because you don't know in a hundred years which of those facts are going to matter. So maybe something that, that other people are willing to fudge turns out to be the issue on which, which the future hinges. And so if you're really trying to leave an accurate record of the way the world changes, you can't leave out you know, the, the, the piece that looks uncomfortable right now. Um, I, I, I will say one of the things that you, you probably don't know is that the first professional, if you will, history of the United States is written in the 1830s. And the hero of the revolution was Samuel Adams and Samuel, George Bancroft. And Samuel Adams was in that book brilliant because of his ideas and how he would stand up in front of these, um, uh, the, 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 yeah, what is it called when everybody gets together and talks, you know? Yeah, 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 he would get up and, and, um, and, and say brilliant things. And the entire United States was formed on the fact that, that this guy was so freaking smart and he spoke so well and he was just this great leader because that's what they needed in the 1830s. But this is a completely different Samuel Adams, and I think speaks really importantly to the present. Obviously, much more researched and a much fairer representation, I think, because George Bancroft's Samuel Adams could do nothing wrong. But, um, but the, I, I do think that if you stick close to your sources, you uncover truths that perhaps unconsciously reflect the moment the same way that art, for example, in our generation, we can't see forgeries, but the next generation says, oh, wait a minute, you know, why is there a toaster in, you know, Da Vinci? Um, and, um, and that, I think, means that you just close your eyes. My, my problem usually is the opposite. When I write about things, people don't like to, to read them. You should read my email every morning. <laughs> but you've also been extremely good at being able to unwrite history that has been written to the wrong, written to uh, destructive ends. And I'm, Frederick Jackson Turner is a perfect example. I mean, an entire generation of historians, right, were yes, nursed at his right, were nursed in this school of a line of thinking which was completely manufactured and which had pernicious results. Correct. So yes. Yeah, so, but but the Frederick Jackson Turner story, I have to say, is a really interesting one because, of course, he's the guy who, who really first coined the idea of American exceptionalism. And what he was really doing is he was looking at the fact that in the 1890s, a lot of Americans were concerned that the frontier was gone. And he writes this this uh, uh, lecture in which he says that. In fact, America is not great because of Samuel Adams. America is great because democracy is created on the frontier. So what happens if you get rid of the frontier? Uh-oh, we might be in really big trouble. But the fun part about that is the whole reason we get that is because the 1890 census was so freaking corrupt, they didn't manage to, because they just, the, the Republicans had just added six states to the union based on the idea that there were so many people in them and they rushed them through in 1889 and 1890 before the census because they knew there was never going to be anybody in Montana. I'm sorry for all of you people from Montana in South Dakota and, and North Dakota and all that. So it took them years to get that census. They, um, it's totally corrupt. They finally finish a census and then, do you know, that sucker caught fire. <laughs> 
And they put it out with water when they were using fountain pens. So they ha have to, uh, just don't start me on the 1890 census. So, so then, the, then the census director gets fired. The new census director has to figure out um, what the heck he's going to do. And he's late, and he's panicked, and he gets to the point in the form where it says, where's the frontier? And he goes, oh, screw it. We don't have a frontier any longer. And he goes on, and Frederick Jackson Turner goes, oh. I'm going to change world history based on the fact we don't have a frontier any longer. And that whole, that whole story of how that becomes such an important moment is like, just like the, all the rest of us, he's like, crap, I'm up against a deadline. I'll just say we don't have a frontier, and then I don't have to write that page. <laughs> so, so I think that one of the things that both of us do is turn history into real people which is, at the end of the day, what it is and what um, your Samuel Adams conveys so brilliantly, that he's just a kind of schlub who doesn't have a job, really, until That's he... That's the word I was looking for. Oh, my God. Until, he ch <laughs> in, until all those things that he did, his love of children, his love of the written word, his love of thinking, his love of liberty, all those things came together and changed the world. And you've done it so beautifully. That's so very thank kind you. of you. Thank you for doing this. Thank you all thank for coming. You. Thank you both so much for such a beautiful evening and a thought-provoking evening.